right. What's going on, everybody? Um, my name is Ryan Perry, and I am one of the maintainers of Pyroscope, which is an open source continuous profiling library. And if you don't know what that is, you're in the right place, because today I'll be giving an introduction to continuous profiling. And if you do know what that is, you'll also find this talk useful because I will also give a couple of demos of cases where continuous profiling has or could be used in order to debug performance issues and kind of give more examples of uh, why and how you can use continuous profiling in production. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to say is that the continuous profiling landscape is pretty large at this point. Um, there are a lot of continuous profilers out there, and it has kind of risen in prominence, I would say, over the last uh, couple of years due to the fact that people are now kind of starting to realize that you can do continuous profiling in production without causing too much overhead. And I'll explain more about that later. But basically here, I've listed a couple, definitely not all of them. Um, but on the open source side, you have Pyroscope, obviously, um, Parka, Pixie, and all of those are <clears throat> open source pro profilers. Then on the enterprise side, you have companies like Splunk, Google Cloud, Datadog, who also, who also have continuous profilers as well. And basically, if you take nothing else away from this talk, um, all of these have the same kind of output in general, but they have different ways of getting there. And so each one has its own quirks and um, pros and cons. And so if you take nothing else away from today, it's just that if you're not continuous profiling, whatever your applications are or using it in your applications, rather, you should definitely look into it because there's a reason why so many companies and projects have started to pop up doing this, because there actually is a lot of really practical use cases that can save a ton of time that can save a bunch of money, um, sometimes can even make a bunch of money depending on what kind of company you're running. And, um, and so there's just a lot of use for continuous profiling. And so I'm going to next get into these, all of these profilers, as you can see, are using what are called flame graphs. And so let's get into what a flame graph is. Um, basically, uh, over here on the right side, <clears throat> I have a, uh, a picture from Julia Evans. I uh, got it from her Twitter. Um, and she's been working on profilers for a long time. And uh, she also mentions Brendan Gregg in here. He's also one of the pioneers of using profiling, particularly flame, flame graphs, to represent profiling data. And what that is, is that here you see that there is one function called main. And above it, there are two functions, alligator and panda. And basically what this is showing is that of the 100% of the time that main was running, alligator was running 60% of that time and panda was running 40% of that time. And main called these two functions. Then alligator called bite, alligator also called teeth and alligator called one other function. And so you can kind of see how this is sort of a uh, visual representation of what a stack trace would otherwise represent. And you can see if you were trying to optimize this function, you would probably start with alligator because more of the time is being spent in this, in this function. And so uh, basically uh, the takeaway here is just that flame graphs show which parts of your code are consuming the most resources doesn't necessarily have to be uh, time or CPU utilization. Another popular one is memory, um, but there, any data that's formatted this way that has some kind of metric attached to it can also be represented as a profile. And so next, let's talk about a practical example. So here you can see there's um, a function that's, this is like a Python server or a rep representation of a Python server. And on the server, there's two functions, fast function and slow function, that server.py calls directly. And then there's one function work, which gets called by each of those functions that simply iterates over a counter until it reaches the parameter passed in. And basically what this is showing is that slow function is running for eight units of time and fast function is working for two units of time corresponding to the eight and two here. And then they each call work, which then run for eight and two respectively as well. And so you can kind of see how it helps to really 
um, visualize what the, what the program is working on or what resources are being spent on and how you might be able to use that when things aren't so nicely named slow function and fast function. And it's instead just a function going slow and a function going fast. And so now let's talk about why profiling is important. So there's a popular statistic out there that Amazon loses about uh, 1% of uh, revenue for every 100 milliseconds in latency. And so you can imagine for them, there's having something like a flame graph is really useful because they're able to see sort of where the application is spending time. And that can equal bill literally billions of dollars in revenue for a company like theirs. Uh, similarly, Google uh, is reported to have to generate approximately 20% less traffic for every 500 milliseconds in latency. And um, again, you can imagine that there is a ton of code that's running on Google's various servers um, in various regions, whatever it might be. And uh, this, this drop in traffic based off of latency is something that could potentially easily be corrected or at least be easily be diagnosed if there's a flame graph that's explaining of you know whatever latency there is that exists, how much of that time is attributed to which functions or which services, and they could then use that to to break this down and and improve the uh, the traffic that they're serving. Um, similarly, Uber has uh, has a, on their blog talked about using profiling and flame graphs to cut their metrics ingestion latency by in half, and that was simply by just using profiling and being able to see exactly where their program was spending time and how they could improve it, uh, basically find the low hanging fruits there. And so uh, kind of, um, you know, that's a good uh, transition into this. So for Pyroscope, we built a real world rideshare example to sort of exhibit how this actually works in practice. Oh, let me move my little um, think over here, how this works in practice. And so basically, um, the reason we did this is because, again, as you can imagine, if you're a company like Uber or Lyft or uh, insert whatever rideshare companies um, are probably wherever you are locally that are competing, uh, you could imagine where just a tiny bit of latency could be the difference between someone staying in your app and going to your competitor's app because your app is loading too slow or something which then translates into revenue and, and all that kind of stuff. Similarly, understanding um, how your different services work, especially in like a Kubernetes or a microservices oriented architectures, it's really useful to understand where all of this time is being spent. And so in this case, we have a rideshare company um, that does three simple functions, orders a car, orders a bike and orders a scooter. And then we have three regions that this uh, that this rideshare company is operating in, and they're and it's instrumented with Pyroscope. Um, there's an endpoint for each route for each respective um, vehicle, and um, and then each one is also tagged appropriately, which will come into play later. I'll explain more in a second. But um, but basically, what's going to happen is that every unit of time, in this case, ten seconds. What Pyroscope does is it will uh, collect the stack traces. Um, it will it will basically sample the stack trace rather and um, package that up. And every ten seconds, the data will go from the servers to the Pyroscope server, where it will then store, compress, and store that data so that it can be queried later if you want to go back and see where a performance issue occurred. So let me jump into a real world example here. And so here we have a running a running Pyroscope server. We'll get to that in a second. But in the meantime, let's explain what's happening in this rideshare application. So as I mentioned before, there are three, an endpoint for bike, an endpoint for scooter, and an endpoint for car. And each one of those calls a simple function, ordering a car, bike, or scooter, respectively. And um, the other important part here is just uh, starting the setting the Pyroscope server address and starting the profiling um, for Pyroscope. And basically, this is just going to make it so that we can later see uh, what's going on. One thing to note here is that there I mentioned it was running in multiple regions and that region is a tag. 
here we're setting from the environment variable, we're setting the tag of region based off of whatever region is running this particular code. And so if we go into one of these functions like carb, it's a very simple function, just calls utility dot find nearest vehicle and uh, calls it for a car, bike calls it for a bike, scooter calls it for a scooter. And so the utility function is where a little bit more interesting stuff is happening. The important part here, and again, I'll link to all this code so that you can um, look through it if you wanna see more what's happening. It's really only these uh, four files. And really what's happening here that's important though is that we're tagging each, um, when it calls the find nearest vehicle fun function, we're tagging each uh, vehicle uh, under the vehicle tag. So uh, car, when this is calling it for a car, scooter, bike, and that will allow us to slice and dice the data later if we wanna look at specifically cars or specifically bikes and see what's going on with their respective performance. And so here I have a Docker Compose example running. And if I pull it up, it looks like this. I paused the video for a second to let it run for a little bit so that there'll be some data here. But this is what we end up with. And as you can kind of imagine here, there is a order bike function, an order car function, and an order scooter function. And you can click and, and view each one of these individually um, or look at them as a, as a whole. And so what you see here is something, so this is where we get into the interesting part of where you use continuous profiling and why you use it. So in this case, um, we sort of engineered a situation where cars were taking up more, uh, more CPU utilization than bikes or scooters. Um, but here you can see that represented in the code. And so, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> one of the things, oh, I guess I should also mention, so these bars up here correspond to CPU utilization. This is a little bit more unique to the way that uh, we do it at Pyroscope. Um, some other profilers have other mechanisms for being able to pick a particular time. But the key here is that with continuous profiling, the idea is that you can look at any particular time period and see what was going on. Um, so for example, in this case, if I wanted to see this time period, I can zoom in like this and see specifically what was happening during this time period. And um, as I mentioned before, if we zoom in on particularly cars, what we can see here is that there actually is a unique pattern of high CPU utilization down to low CPU utilization, down to high CPU utilization over and over again. And um, this is something that you might not necessarily know why that's happening without profiling. However, with profiling, we can actually see specifically what this uh, order car function is doing during this collective time period. Um, also something that's sort of specific to the way PowerScope does things is that here we can actually see, so let's say um, here you can select a low CPU utilization time period and a high CPU utilization time period and see the flame graph for each of these. And if you're looking at these just, um, you know, kind of straightforward, it's, it's hard to see exactly what the difference between these two flame graphs are. Um, but something that also we've incorporated into Pyroscope is the ability to look at the diff between two flame graphs. So in this case, we can see in the, um, in the red and in the green, the green represents to code that was removed and the red represents code that was added. And so what it looks like is between the low CPU utilization period and the high CPU utilization period, there is an additional 175% of CPU utilization being spent on uh, this check driver availability function, which then calls this mutex lock function, um, which is actually um, kind of spoilers the, uh, the issue here. And, um, and so, yeah, so this is a, just one example of the way you can, you can use this. But the important part here is that uh, with continuous profiling, you can actually see the last, you know, the last hour, uh, you know, that this has been running. But for another application that may have been running longer, let's say, for example, um, there's a demo application here that is, uh, that's running.
And actually with this, you could go even the past like year and I could see. And so what this is showing is the CPU utilization for this entire time period over here on the uh, on the right. And so the key piece of this is we can actually zoom in if we wanted to see what was going on in a particular 10 second time period way back in um, you know, August of uh, August of 2021, we could actually see specifically what was happening during this 10 second time period. These were the functions that um, this is the profile for this 10, 10 second time period um, showing up right here. And so that's just really powerful. That helps you, um, you know, in the past when you're using normal profilers, often what you have to do is you have to try to recreate, let's say you're you get an alert at night that a server is uh, reaching its threshold and you want to go check it out to see what's happening when you wake up or when you finally get around to to digging into it. Maybe it was a transient issue and the actual um, server is now acting more normal again, or maybe it was killed and another server was restarted or something. And so now it's actually much more difficult to go back in time and recreate the set of situation or the situation that and set of circumstances that caused that issue to happen to begin with. And so with continuous profiling, that's not an issue. You can look at the last 30 days or the last 90 days or um, whatever, it, whatever it needs uh, needs to be. And you can actually see exactly what was happening at that time period. And the best part is that you can do this with very little overhead. And so that's um, something that's really important here. And if we jump back into the slides, um, the, uh, so, so what I want to get into is, okay, so I'm talking about, you know, there's normal profilers and then there's continuous profilers, sort of what's the difference between the two. And so, um, basically this is, um, again, just specifically for Pyroscope, how we work is that, um, there is a storage engine that's sort of language agnostic that takes profiling data from any profiler that sends it in, uh, a relatively close format um, and then uh, stores it in the Pyroscope storage engine um, that's built specifically for storing, compressing and storing profiling data. And I'll get more into that in a second. But the, um, the important part here is that basically what we did was we took a lot of open source profilers that were already out there that weren't necessarily built or didn't have quite all of the functionality needed to make them continuous profilers and what we did was we modified all of these to add, uh, for most of them, a C API. For some of them, um, it's written in other languages or other formats, but basically an API that allows um, Pyroscope to get profiling data from these otherwise sort of static um, open source profilers. And then there's a uh, component that sits in the Pyroscope client called the Session Manager that basically collects profiles every uh, n seconds using this API. It transcodes these profiles into a standardized format, and then it sends these profiles to the Pyroscope server, um, where all of the sort of uh, magic happens. And um, you know, here's just an example of some of the profiles we use. For Go, we use pprof. Ruby, we use rbspy, Python, pyspy. Rust, pprof, uh, so on and so forth. And basically any profiler that can get the data into that format mentioned on the, um, mentioned on this slide where it's, you know, function or, uh, yeah, uh, you know, file, function, uh, function, number of uh, whatever the metric is, anything that can uh, give data in that format can then be put into the Pyroscope storage engine. And so the, the issue becomes, if you put all that data into the storage engine, now the question becomes, okay, so what do we do with all of this data once it's in there? Um, you can imagine that if for each one of these, um, each one of these yellow bars is a 10 second time segment, if you're storing data for the last you know, six months, this is a lot of uh, 10 second time segments. I think over a year, it adds up to something like 3 million uh, time segments, so 3 million of these yellow bars. And that's if there's no tags for each tag, and it adds some level of cardinality to the data that then forces you forces more storage. And so 
basically, long story short, the um, it can storage can get really out of hand if the storage engine that's storing this profiling data is not doing something with it as it's continuously receiving these new profiles. And so something that we do to solve this storage problem is, as you can imagine, with uh, stack trace data, there's a lot of repetition in each stack trace that we get each 10 seconds. Um, there's, uh, for, for this case, if it's net HTTP requests, HTTP connection, then there's IO write and IO read. You can see these uh, these colored sections are actually very repetitive. And so what we do is we actually um, use trees in order to compress this data so that we don't have to store these blue segments in this green segment two times. And so that just makes the storage much more efficient there. But there's actually, uh, as you can see, the symbol names themselves can be compressed even further. Uh, net slash is repeated in both of these as well. And so we also do some serialization of the symbol names themselves in order to store them in tries and store them significantly more efficiently than if we just stored this, uh, this raw data. And you can see here the difference in bytes from 39 to 8. And again, I'll share uh, a link to this. This is uh, also in the GitHub repo where you can kind of see it publicly. But um, basically, long story short, Storing the data efficiently is a key piece of continuous profiling because it's not useful if the cost of storing the data is more than the cost that you save from using profiling. And so basically, once you've done all of the storage, the next issue becomes, OK, so now now that we've stored all this data efficiently, how do we query it back efficiently as well? And um, this is something that's also sort of unique to the way that Pyroscope does it. And um, basically what we do is we actually store the data and pre-aggregate it at different time segments so that uh, each one of these uh, blocks corresponds to one of those yellow bars on, the, on that timeline. And so now um, every, t every 20 seconds, we combine these two bars into one 20 second flame graph. And then every 40 seconds, we combine two 20 second flame graphs into one 40 second flame, flame graph. And basically what this does is it turns reading the, reading the data back or querying the data into an O log in operation where you can always query the data efficiently um, without having to merge uh, you know, a bunch of profiles at runtime. So if there's, uh, for an example here, if you have uh, a bunch of segment trees, and let's say you wanted to read 50 seconds worth of data for your query range. So uh, if we weren't doing anything special, you would have to merge, 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 merge four different tree or five different trees together, which is four merge operations in order to get the data that you're looking for. Um, but basically, because we do all of these pre-aggregations, rather than merging uh, four or five different trees together, we can actually merge one 40 second tree and one 10 second tree versus merging five 10 second trees. And this basically makes it so that as you saw in that timeline, even if you're querying six months of data or 10 seconds of data, it still returns um, relatively quickly. So now that we've talked a little bit about profiling in general, the difference between profilers and continuous profilers, and gone through some examples of how you can use profiling, the thing I wanted to end on was sort of what is the future of continuous profiling? And of course, nobody can predict the future, but based off of some conversations that uh, we've heard and had with the community members, with uh, people who are working on various different kinds of profilers and things that uh, companies have even sometimes asked for explicitly, is the ability to enhance the other observability metrics, often known as the three pillars of observability, traces, metrics, and logs, and be able to enhance those using continuous profiling. And so what this looks like in practice is for a particular trace or for a particular log, you can use the set of metadata of tags to be able to see for that particular time period or for that particular trace, can you see exactly what was being worked on on the server, what resource utilization looks like in profile form, um, maybe down to user ID or request ID, or and still be able to aggregate up to higher bird's eye views of this as well. 
And the fact that profiling allows you to have these unique snapshots of resource usage at different points in time, it really unlocks the potential to do this for the future. So before we go, I want to show one more example, um, basically using the rideshare example that I showed earlier, but showing how it might look to be able to connect that rideshare example to a tracing solution and see what it looks like when the logs are, or when the traces are linked to the profiles. Okay, so here we have the same example I was showing before, uh, slightly different, slightly modified, the same rideshare application. The only difference is that here we've added a rideshare.go file. And in this file, we've used open telemetry, added tracing, and using honeycomb for this example, you could use whatever tracer you prefer. And as the as the provider here and so what we can see if we jump into the ui here is that as you would expect there are a lot of requests that are functioning as they as they normally should um, with uh, low latency and then we have this series of high latency requests as well and so what i was explaining was that this seems like a very good use case for where you could use tracing to enrich these examples. So if we were to click on this trace, for example, now we see this distributed trace, we see sort of where time is being spent. We know that time is slow in the car handler, but we don't know exactly why. And so what we could do is we can actually go here and we can see that there is a specific uh, profile ID associated with this span. And so now if we actually run this in Pyroscope, we can see exactly during that particular request for this particular profile, we can see what resource utilization looks like, in this case, CPU, and see where it was being spent. And so that's just one example of the way you connect it to trace, traces, but if you're using other solutions out there, like, for example, a low key for logs or uh, whatever it may be, you might be able to also use the same sort of methodology to connect those with continuous profiling and be able to sort of debug issues faster and be able to understand and drill down and get a more enriched version of understanding exactly what's going on in your code. All right. Well, that's all I have for today. Um, I went through a lot of stuff, a lot of content, and pretty quickly, a lot of this is in either blog form or in documentation in the GitHub repo. And so I will add links to all these slides and uh, add, add a link to the slide where you can access them somewhere as well. But other than that, uh, thanks for listening. And I will open it up to questions if anybody has any.